great fun to be here. Uh, this was my home for a whole lot of years, and it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here today. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Dean uh, Sartorelli, distinguished guests, and, and most importantly, uh, passionate students. And I know you're passionate to be here Friday morning on a uh, football weekend. You know, I'm really impressed that there are this many people here. Thank you, President Clements, uh, for having me as a guest at this fabulous university, for letting me tell the Energy uh, Corporation of America story, and for that uh, introduction. I always get a little kind of nervous at introductions. I was very nervous during yours. And I, I've got to tell you, um, it was very kind and somewhat accurate. But in honesty, <laughs> I'm much more like the students uh, in the audience than the guy who was described by your president. Uh, just, uh, it seems like yesterday I was indeed uh, a student and, and no different from you all, I was broke. Nobody in this room is broke, I know that if you're a student. Um, people usually teach that wise, hotshot executives like I am had this great business plan and got all this stuff started out that way. And, and they just assumed this old guy was just successful from the start. That was not me at all. I had a, a very good education and a dream and nothing else. And so that's exactly where you guys sitting in this room are today. There's very, very, very little difference uh, from you. And quite frankly, uh, my early career uh, was really a series of accidents uh, more than uh, any kind of plan at all. So uh, don't be worried that you don't have a big plan today or you don't have that. You and I are just almost the same people. Here's a picture of, of me and, and uh, how the story at, uh, at ECA began. Uh, today, I, I'd like to tell you uh, about how the story began and then go forward rather quickly into where we are today so you can see the comparisons, and then talk a little bit about the fabulous, indeed world-changing uh, industry, energy industry that you all sit right in the middle of, and, and finish up with some things I learned along the way that cost me way more than that undergraduate tuition. I can, I can tell you that much. This is Julie, uh, my uh, lifelong uh, partner uh, in business uh, and in life, and, and uh, my uh, lifelong love affair right here. And you can tell I adore her. I started out at USC. I didn't go for a great education. I went to be a famous baseball player. And uh, after a, a very short time at USC, I, I really found some people who could play baseball a lot better than I could. And uh, uh, I got hurt some, but mainly I couldn't play well enough. And then I had to get a degree in something. And at that time, back in the 60s, we were going to the moon, and everybody was being an aerospace engineer. And I just liked being outside and was kind of good in math and science. And uh, so I got a degree in petroleum engineering. And then I got lucky. When I graduated, it was a very robust time, and I got a lot of job offers and uh, from major oil companies and other companies. And, uh, I looked them over, and I wasn't this smart, but it, it turned out well. I actually took the lowest paying job offer. I, uh, I took the, the job offer that would give me the most experience in the least amount of time. And when you guys are going out into the marketplace here in a, a few short years, think about that, because that turned out to be a, a very good decision. Worked for a fabulous company. They're no longer in business. They merged with uh, Chevron. The company was Unical. They had a great culture. They gave me wonderful experience and moved me around the country. And within a couple of years, <clears throat> in my own mind, I was way smarter than uh, I actually was. I was running their uh, largest single asset, the Grayling Platform, in the Gulf or in the uh, Cook Inlet in Alaska. And I got a phone call from my father, who had a, a little heart problem, and he asked me if I would drill a well uh, for him, a relatively shallow well in, in West Virginia. I've got to be honest, I didn't know where West Virginia was. I was the California surfer kid. I knew it was south of Alaska and east of, uh, east of California, and that was it, you know. And I, I, like everybody else, said, yeah, I've been to Virginia. I've been to Richmond. Yeah, you know. Anyway, I, I thought that my, my vision for this whole thing is I would come back here and drill this well real quickly and then get back to the real oil business in Alaska and around the world and get back to what I was doing in, in my career. And... Um, 
to cut through all the whatever, uh, long story short, six weeks later, I had it so screwed up. I felt guilty and quit Unical and moved to uh, Glenville, West Virginia, where Glenville State is, Gilmer County, <clears throat> and tried to get things straightened out. And, and very shortly thereafter, our, our mother got breast cancer. She and my father had had a, a wonderful 40-year marriage, and, and they moved to California to be... Uh, to be uh, near Stanford and see if she could get well. And I was left in West Virginia with uh, the only employee, but I wasn't getting paid. Uh, we had about 50,000 in assets, 100,000 in liabilities, and no cash, and owed everybody money. And it was an ugly time. It, I lived in a trailer on the banks of the Little Kanawha River, uh, small trailer. I always say I was single white port. I wasn't even double white port. And uh, <clears throat> we... Uh, we really struggled for four years, made some good relationships, met some good people, and uh, it, it is great fun. Uh, some of you <coughs> older gentlemen, rather than the students in the back, you, you know when you get your Social Security uh, uh, reconciliation each year and it says how much you made? From 1972 to 1976, it accurately describes what I made, zero each year. And we, we just barely could make it. And then, uh, through a wonderful man. I had become his mentee. He was my mentor. We uh, raised enough money to drill a couple of wells, and we drilled two wells in Gilmer County, and I became instantly smart because we drilled 200 successful wells in the middle. And that is always a good way to start a, a uh, company. That, that is a business plan you want to use. Unfortunately, we didn't have any plan on that. Quite frankly, after the discovery and we started making a little cash flow, just to put it in perspective, the first well alone made twice as much money in the first year than the entire company was making before, and we drilled 40-some of them in that, that year. So it was just crazy the way things changed and grew. But I really wasn't, I had no idea how to run a company. I, I was a, probably a competent project manager. You would have hired me to run your small project here or there. But to run a big company, I knew nothing about that. And so my learning process really began. And with that, here's some of the historical highlights and some of the things I learned. This is a wonderful picture. Uh, ECA regularly r wins the corporate cup, uh, athletic events uh, and health and wellness events down in Charleston. <clears throat> and here is a, a picture. And our work really is fun. But let me tell you, it's a continuous struggle. And just so you have fun, the guy pulling hardest on this line, this guy right here, is sitting in the front or the second row. Uh, that's Kyle Mork, so he's working at it too. Um, let me get a little more highlights here. We are uh, an exploration and production company. We've been in business 50 years this year. Uh, the first 10 years, it literally ran out of the uh, home I grew up in. Uh, our roots and expertise are in, in West Virginia operations. That is really an advantage. Uh, you see, West Virginia, I'm a reservoir engineer by training, and West Virginia has really pretty poor rocks for producing oil and gas. And we got good, very good, at producing from poor rocks before the whole world changed about five years ago in this shale gas revolution, because that's what poor rocks are. They're in this shale type. And so we got very good at that. So it was really uh, an advantage to be there. Today, um, if we were a public company, we'd be about the 35th largest uh, exploration and production company uh, in, the, uh, in the country. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our culture. Um, we're family culture. It's, we call ourselves the ECA family. What that means is that all for one, one for all. We pull together all the time. If you've got a problem, it's my job to help you. If I've got a problem, it's your job to help me and on that. And then here's some we demand of ourselves excellence in everything we do. We simply don't want to be mediocre or average or we get, did pretty well on that. We demand excellence, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a little bit here. We're really an engineering company. And what engineer, are there any engineers in the room? Come on. There got to be a few. Oh, thank you, thank you. But I'll define all of engineering school for you. All of engineering school basically is, here is a problem, find a solution. And that's what we do. We're problem solvers. We just solve those problems all the time. 
We have a low cost culture. Uh, we're in the commodity business. I'll talk a little bit more about commodities, but it drives all we do. There's a huge difference between a cost cutting culture and a low cost culture. Cost cutting is really easy. I go, if you don't cut costs by 10% at the end of next week, you're fired. You'll cut costs in all in the wrong places. A low cost culture comes from the bottom up. The people are looking, how can we save money? The same way you do at your home, the same way you do when you go to the market and you say, well, I can buy the filet mignon for this or I can buy the chuck for this. You make a decision on that, on, and that's the way a low-cost culture works. We have a really long-range culture. This is one of the great things about being a private rather than a public company. We're not driven by the quarterly reports and the markets. We plan for decades, not for weeks. Uh, we won't take just a short-term gain. We want a long-term gain in things, so we plan that way. And then lastly, we do a ton of strategic planning. We model. We want to know what's going to happen out in front. Now, I didn't do that at the start, but I sure do it now. We get out in front and know what all that modeling is. Here are some of our assets. We've got a, a lot of wells and, and produce a lot of gas and got a lot of reserves. Biggest asset, uh, second biggest asset, is we have about 5,000 drilling locations to drill up in West Virginia and Pennsylvania, uh, plus other stuff around the world. Let me put that in perspective. We're drilling about 50 a year, so we've only got about 100-year inventory uh, of things to drill up. And uh, our biggest asset are our best people. We simply absolutely have the best people. And uh, let me see if I can tell you how important that is. Um, you all intuitively know the uh, McDonald's hamburgers business model. Uh, they've got, I don't know, 50,000 uh, restaurants around. They've got a million or millions of employees. They flip billions of burgers and they make a quarter of a cent a burger. They are a labor intensive business. We are the exact opposite. We are an asset intensive business. To frame that for you, uh, our average employee, on average, manages $10 million in assets. So we need a few good employees, and we can invest in our employees. We don't need tons of employees, but we certainly need some. Um, here are some things that differentiate us. Leadership is one of them. We have simply the best board of directors. I'm honored that one is here with me, Governor Caperton. We have the best board of directors around, and it, it has absolutely been fabulous. They are mentors to me, and uh, I will talk a little bit about that later on, but I would challenge you to be uh, mentors in this changing world. Uh, decades of inventory. Uh, we've got a world-class history of, uh, of growth, and uh, we've got some very, very unique financial instruments. I'll talk about all of those. Um, We've got a unique information system. When I say the word map, all of you think of that thing you fold up and put in your glove compartment or the pretty thing on the wall. I'm going to completely change your opinion of maps. All of our maps are digital. Uh, now when I say the word map, think of a thousand layers of data, and you can pick any of the layers you want to amalgamate together. That lets you that lets you absolutely work at a speed of light rather than the speed of walking to the uh, file room and getting data out of the file room. If, if you think about it, our most valuable people, our engineers and our geologists, used to be high-paid file clerks because they would go to the file room and spend time, and we always misfiled everything, don't worry about that. We, they would go to the file room and spend a bunch of time getting it. Now it's a mouse click and they have all that information. And by the way, when it's all electronic, you can't misfile it. It's a really helpful thing on that. We um, <clears throat> have some exceptional employee programs. I told you our most important asset were our employees, and that is indeed it. Uh, we have uh, profit sharing. We had a wonderful profit sharing meeting just yesterday where we spread the profits of the company throughout all the employees. We have world-class wellness program. Uh, we. Uh, have been awarded the top awards in the country and it frankly gives us a competitive advantage because our people are so healthy that indeed they don't miss work. I, I was telling uh, President Clements just a moment ago a fascinating statistic to me. Our um, sick leave policy is the following. 
if you're sick, stay home, we'll pay you. That's it. We average, our people are so well, we average just slightly over one sick day per employee per year. It's an amazing statistic, and all these good people are working hard uh, all the time. So anyway, we also have dependent uh, scholarship funding. Our, our uh, employees, their kids uh, get company scholarships. Uh, we have about 20 uh, of those scholarships here at WVU uh, right now. So, and they're, all of them, we, at this time, there are 55 uh, employees, children on scholarships at some university in the U.S. Let me go forward now uh, about a little bit about our business. Essentially, our business is, oh, excuse, I've skipped something. What do you get when you do all that? Uh, this is the growth of the market value of the company. Uh, in 37 years, we've averaged a 35% compounded annual growth rate uh, during that period of time. So it's worked out pretty well for the shareholders. Let me go on. We are in the um, exploration and development business. Uh, we explore for, develop, transport, produce uh, energy, primarily oil and gas. This is a picture in New Zealand of a successful well. That well is uh, being completed right there, and it's, it's uh, Mount Taranaki in the background. Here's what we utilize. Uh, most of the hydrocarbons in West Virginia are about a mile deep or a little deeper than that, and uh, we use this uh, equipment that's a drilling rig to drill about a mile down, and then we drill uh, more than a mile in ca occasionally sideways and drill horizontally underneath the ground. It's a very uh, wonderful system. Here's just a picture of some of the offshore work we do. That is about 30 miles offshore. It's uh, stabilized by computers. It stays in one place. It's floating there. And you drill and test and produce eventually. Here's a whole active drilling area in West Virginia. And, and you're far enough back, it's a little hard to see. But that's that drilling rig again. And um, we're set up to produce the wells over here in the red. And then the drilling's going on. What you can't see is that whole area is covered with a massive tarp. Literally not one thing touches the ground. We'll be active in that area for about three months. And that area will produce for the next 40 years. Pretty good trade. Here's just a couple of sites to give you perspective. This one, oh, oh, excuse me. This one down here at the bottom is drilling still. This one is being uh, completed, and then all both those sites will be reclaimed and grassed over in a very short period of time. Here is a great fun picture. That is a computer-generated map about a mile and a half underneath the ground. We our industry is so technology demanding. We use more computer power, the engine, the, the energy industry, than any other industry in the country. Uh, the only thing that uses more computer power than us, quite frankly, is the U.S. military. Um, what it does, we're very asset intensive, which I, I mentioned, and we need great people. And the good news is we don't need tons of people. We're not like McDonald's, so we can afford to take care of our people. It's a very good situation. I'm gonna, I love these two pictures because they tell you so much this is the completion process for a well. And just so you frame, I keep pushing the wrong buttons up here. So you frame yourself, look at this. Because the next picture you're going to see is exactly the same picture several months later. This completion operation will go on for two or three weeks in duration and then be done. There's the same picture. Everything's reclaimed. Over here are producing wells. Over here are the producing wells. And then going into tanks and that kind of thing. Uh, it's 100% restored. That single location will produce enough energy for 300,000 homes for a year. That uh, is the lowest cost energy. That's about, it would, it would fuel from that location half the homes in West Virginia for a year. It's an amazing statistic. Oh, and one other little statistic. It's fairly good for West Virginia. The farmers that own the mineral rights there for no investment, they will get, over the life of that field, about $20 million in payments. <clears throat> Fairly good transaction. OK, let's talk in general about the energy business. Um, 
we don't think it's embedded in everything we do and we don't think a lot about it. Of course, it's warmth and cooling and light and power and transportation. You think less about it. That egg you had for breakfast was refrigerated, took energy all night, and then you heated it on the stove and cooked it uh, on that. The uh, medicine you have is largely derived from energy products, usually hydrocarbon products. But there's some other things that just kind of pass along. Standard of living, go into it a little more detail later, but there's a direct correlation between energy use and the quality of life we all leave. Uh, entertainment, uh, I hope you all turned off your cell phones, but uh, you couldn't do that without energy. Certainly lifestyle, freedom of movement, you can move around. We talk about freedom of movement. How many people, all the freshmen I know for sure, how many counties are there in West Virginia? 55? Uh, why are there 55 counties in West Virginia? See, when it was originally designed, the county seats were one day's horse ride apart, and they wanted to have so many different counties. We don't need that anymore. Quite frankly, uh, you, you know, it'll never happen, but you could have two or three counties. We have such freedom of movement. If you guys want to go to the beach on a Friday afternoon, you can get in a car and go. That's unheard of in previous generations. We all know that, but that's all because we have abundant energy. Women's empowerment. Now, this is a touchy subject. I'm at a university level, so I can say this. There is a direct correlation, inverse but direct, between electricity, power in a country, and number of children born. When there is electricity in the country, family sizes go down, women get more freedom in their life, they can go for education rather than having nine or ten kids. It's critically important around the world and in the U.S. We're spoiled by it because we've had electricity since long before any of us were born, but there is a one-off correlation on that in the, in the women's movement and much, much more. A um, little bit more about the industry. It's the world's largest industry. Uh, almost 10 percent of the world's GNP is spent on energy. Uh, that's about 10 cents out of every dollar in the world is spent on energy. That's a crazy big number. And it's a, it's a key economic indicator. The U.S. uses uh, the most energy. The U.S. is also the most energy efficient country in the world. We only spend about 6% of our GNP on energy, where other countries spend that almost 10%. That's a huge difference. Let me, uh, let me finish that thought on that. That 3.5% difference, 3.5%, that's hardly measurable, I can't even find it. That is, at our GNP level, a new free car for a family every three or four years. That's the difference in savings, or quite frankly, the mortgage payment on a modest house is the difference in savings in energy costs between here and around the world. Energy cost is critically important, and it raises our standard of living as well. Types of energy, got hydrocarbon, coal, oil, and gas. We all know that. Hydro, the original renewable energy, and a wonderful source, absolutely wonderful source. We've got other renewables. You hear about them, uh, wind and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, solar photovoltaic and solar thermal, hot water heating, and nuclear, all forms of energy. Here's some costs. We relatively don't, we don't think that much about costs of energy. I want to talk first wholesale costs. This electricity we're using right here was generated by uh, possibly nuclear, unlikely hydro here, certainly uh, probably coal and maybe uh, natural gas. But all in, it's costing four cents a kilowatt hour for this electricity. We're paying retail about 12 cents for transporting it and distributing it and storing it and all that kind of thing and ensuring that we have it on that. <clears throat> State-of-the-art wind, fully backed up, costs 17 cents a kilowatt hour. State-of-the-art State solar photovoltaic, that's solar directly to electrons, costs about 40 cents a kilowatt hour. All these things are backed up. Crazy numbers, Marcellus gas, costs three quarters of one cent per kilowatt hour. Crazy numbers. And lastly, now I'm going to get in trouble here, but before you guys all go out and buy your electric cars, 
Gasoline costs nine cents a kilowatt hour, and uh, if you buy an electric car, you're going to be putting electricity in it at 12 cents a kilowatt hour, so you're going to be paying a third more for your power for that car than you would uh, if you were running it with gasoline. And I, frankly, electric cars would help us because we sell natural gas and you'd have to generate more electricity and all that stuff. But those, those are pretty compelling numbers that you don't see too much. Skipping over to the Marcellus, it has changed the world. Uh, it is the second biggest gas field in the world. It's crazy numbers. Uh, the only bigger field is uh, between uh, Qatar and, uh, and uh, Iran, and uh, it's the, the largest gas field in the U.S., and, and it's even crazier than that. The Marcellus didn't produce enough gas in 2008 to heat this room or cool this room. It didn't produce anything, and now it produces about 15% of the gas in this country. And I don't know, we, we, we're not sure, but our best estimate is that it's only about 5% developed. It will go on. It is just a huge thing, and it's going to change things absolutely wonderfully in the future. Let me talk about what has changed. Because most people don't understand, they hear a ton about uh, fracking. And by the way, I love that word because you can tell, it's one of the few words you can tell the, the person's point of view by how it's spelled. Uh, forever, for the last 60 years, it comes from the word fracture. And it was spelled F-R-A-C-I-N-G. And so the industry spells it F-R-A-C-I-N-G. And the New York Times, who sometimes doesn't support the industry, uh, spells it with a K in it. And it's largely spelled with a K now, but you can tell the person's position on how it's spelled. But what it is, it's only a small part of what's done. Uh, we are contacting way more surface area. And, uh, the best example I can think of, if I gave you all in this room the job of getting a thousand gallons of Coca-Cola through one straw and you had to do it in an hour, that'd be a heck of a problem. I don't know exactly how you'd do that. But if I covered this whole wall with straws so we had more contact area and you had to get the same thousand gallons through you'd only get a few drops through each straw. And that's what we do with horizontal drilling. We contact way more area, and then with hydraulic fracturing underneath the ground, you contact even a greater amount of area. So it's about contact. And the hydraulic fracturing process goes on for a very short period of time, oh, in days to weeks uh, in the total life of these wells that produce for uh, years and years. Here's what, if you just look at the bottom here for a second, you can see the change. An old well in West Virginia might have produced 100 uh, MCF and cost about a half a million dollars. A new well, horizontally drilled, produces about 5,000 MCF and costs about six million dollars. So you're getting about 50 times the gas out of it for about 12 times the cost. Uh, those economics... Uh, Things are really, I'm not a great businessman, but those, those economics seem like they work. Um, let's talk a little bit more. That's a picture. You're seeing the whole thing of fracturing. This area right here, I would say, is about two acres to get, put things in perspective. What we do, we inject fresh water and sand into the ground with some chemicals that reduce uh, friction and that kind of thing. We uh, in inject it at high rates. We inject, oh, three or four million pounds of sand and four million gallons of water in, in less than 5% chemicals. I just want to, I've got so many people who may not be in this area. I see Dr. Soon here, who I know uh, is, uh, knows more about this than I do. But the chemicals we use in, in fracking are pretty simple. We use a surfactant to reduce the friction. That would be the same thing you washed your hands with, the soap this morning, or washed your dishes with last night. We use an um, antibacterial agent to kill the bacteria in the water that, that's naturally here on the surface. That would be the Purell you used on your hands. And we use a guire gum. Ooh, that sounds dangerous, doesn't it? Uh, to thicken things up a little bit so it'll carry the sand. That is actually the product that thickened your yogurt this morning. 
And if you, any of you want to see exactly what chemicals we put in these things, you can go on the internet and check because we post everything. Energy Corporation of America posts everything that it, it pumps in the ground. And uh, there's another statistic that I love to tell. We have fracked over 10,000 times and never had an environmental problem. I'm betting you, you can't walk across University Avenue here 10,000 times and not get hit by a car. I mean, statistically, we are so far ahead on this that it, this is just not a question to us, but it, certainly we hear a lot about it in the press. Um, a little bit more about it. This just gives you a little bit of a view. One of the reasons we're so sure, we cement three quarters of an inch, three sting, strings of heavy steel pipe between the fresh water and where we're fracking. So we, we've got multiple barriers, and we know we monitor all that, and we know it just isn't. It's all done. And, and the fracking, we're, we're down at five or 6,000 feet, and everybody says, well, maybe you'll frack back into the fresh water at 100 feet. We'd love to if we could do it. We're, we're really lucky if we frack 200 feet away from the well bore, much less the thousands of feet back to the surface. So I guess from me, and I would be glad to answer any more questions, this is just a non-item to us, and it's changing the world in the cost of energy that we have. Uh, here's a wonderful example of land use. Y you know, I love to say this. It's so much fun, because whenever you can say, never in the history of mankind, whatever follows that is a big statement. You know, if you, if you can say that and back that up, but never in the history of mankind has any resource been harvested with so little, so little intervention in the environment. If you think about it, think about resources, I don't know, what you want to think about farming? If you, you know, Ohio used to be covered with trees. With farming, you impact 100 or a little over 100% of what you harvest all year or continually. Uh, what else? Timbering? If you select cut, you impact half the forest for 15 years. If you clear cut, you impact it all for 15 years. Uh, coal mining, I could get in trouble here, but coal mining, the numbers are if you subsurface mine, you impact about half of what on the surface of what you're subsurfacing mining. If you surface mine, you impact about 300% of the surface that you actually mine. What we do here, here are the statistics, we temporarily impact maybe as much as 25 acres. We impact in the long run, after everything's reclaimed after a year, about six acres, and we harvest almost 1,000 acres. So we're impacting less than 1% of what's, it, what's harvested. It's an absolutely fabulous system, and what it does, it allows for the harvesting of this wonderful resource from deep below the ground and, and quite possibly never any impact of the pretty areas, whatever it be, whether it be a park or a town or a church or something like that, because you can drill under them underneath the ground. It really is a wonderful new technology that's been developed in oh, the last 10, 15 years. Uh, let me talk a little bit about, I'm done with the industry, and here's some things that, that I taught me, and I told you I paid a lot more for these things than, than uh, I actually uh, paid for tuition. Um, learning and an attitude of learning and education is more precious than gold. Uh, business is so tough that you have to be better every year, and the only tools you have to be better every year are education. I can't tell you how valuable uh, what you're getting here at WVU will be, and I can't encourage you enough to be continual learners. Be learning when you're out of school. Be learning your entire life. It, it will make you successful. There's, there's nothing more valuable than that. Um, I have to laugh at this. Understand what business you're in. I didn't understand the business I was in for the first 15 years or so. I, um, I thought I was in the precious depleting mineral business. I thought people needed what we produce, oil and gas, and, and would love us and, and, and all that. And then I learned we were in the commodity business. There was no way to differentiate our product. Let me talk about commodities for a second. Because the worst thing that could, you could ever do is for you guys to become commodities, the students here. Um, a commodity cannot be recognized from uh, other 
similar things in its area. So uh, definitely natural gas is a commodity, but quite frankly, uh, eggs are a commodity. And the world is becoming, because of the internet and information, commoditized. There is, are left, less brands that you will, will depend on that aren't knocked off, either here or abroad. And you all are going to go get jobs pretty quickly. And, and I don't want to encourage you by any means to quickly leave your job or to stay forever at a crummy job. But don't change jobs so much that you get viewed as a commodity and your boss says, well, it's a downturn this year, we'll cut 20 of those. And then, oh, it's good next year, we'll hire them back and forth. There's some terrible commoditization going on with the new Health Care Act where people are being hired for fewer hours so they, they don't qualify necessarily for health care and the expense of that. Don't you guys make yourself, differentiate yourselves so that you indeed are needed by the future employers you have and when your future employers treat your employees that way. Be very worried about being commoditized because the Internet's doing that around the country. Um, understand risk and opportunity. Uh, fascinating, uh, a whole bunch of years ago, uh, the, the senior leaders at ECA uh, with a, a consultant risk rated each other. And uh, it was a one to 10 scale, and if one was you never took a risk, you were kind of worried about turning the lights on because the house might burn down or something. And the other one is you, you were crazy at 10, you'd go whatever. And so they risk rated everybody, and they risk rated me. And when they got to me, uh, my average rating on the one to 10 scale was about 13. And uh, one very smart guy, uh, who Gaston will remember, uh, Joe Casabona, said, you know, you guys don't understand John. He takes high margin opportunities, opportunities that have a great chance of success, and then he works like crazy to de-risk them afterwards. I would rate him as about a five or maybe a seven in this thing, but he's not way up there, but he's gonna go for high margin. So in your businesses, understand the risks and the opportunities. And let me tell you about culture. It is, it is so, so important. Um, our first core value is to treat others as you would like to be treated. And everybody goes, ah, oh, John, that's so nice. It just touches my heart. No, it's very practical. We seek out win-win situations. You see, the problem is that uh, I've been in win-lose situations. And when I'm the loser in a win-lose situation, I have almost never been smart enough to make it win-win. I have always been smart enough to make it lose-lose. And I figure those other people out there are as smart as I am. And if we're not going to head for win-win, we're going to get lose-lose out of this thing. So I would encourage you in business and in life, select win-win situations, and it's going to help you a whole lot. And we have a bias for action. Um, it is not ready, fire, aim, but it is don't take a long time aiming. And uh, here, is, here is an interesting thing. I had the most fascinating discussion uh, a number of years ago with some really smart people uh, you know, I was kind of the guy carrying the bags in the room, and they were smart people, and I was listening, on decision theory. You don't talk enough about decision theory uh, on things, but on decision theory, uh, here's what most of the people in the room and almost all the students in the room understand. There's a right decision and a wrong decision, and you've got to get the right one now. Uh, and by the way, of those decisions, about in the second grade you learned, uh, Fractions, there's about a 50-50 chance. And then some very evil teacher, they're probably evil professors still, some very e evil teacher in about the fourth grade gave you a multiple choice test. And there was one right and many wrong answers. And then there was that horrible answer, none of the above. Remember that one? Okay. Now on that, 
you learn that there's, it's hard to find the right answer, and there are many wrong answers, and I've got to work really hard at this. Let me tell you about decision theory. For informed, knowledgeable people, okay, you've got to know what the situation is, and you're knowledgeable. That would be all the people in the room, and you can get yourself informed. 85% of all decisions are correct. 85% of all decisions. Now I got a question for the, uh, I don't need the guys in the front, the students in the back. If you knew you were going to win 85% of the time at the crap table, how fast would you bet over on the coast or in Las Vegas? Think about it. You'd bet just as fast as you can. So you need to, you need to have a bias for action. And then lastly, the incredible power of encouragement. I can't tell you enough how powerful it is. Encouraging people absolutely absolutely is one of the most important tools you have. And not just kind of patting them on the back and say, yeah, 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 but honestly catching them doing things right. And, and, and they'll be doing things right left and right around you. So just do that. Okay. Things I learned. Trades. This, this is for the undergraduates. And um, I trade sounds so old pedestrian, you know, there's nobody in trades anymore. But I, I define trades as, oh, business school, engineering school, accounting, oh, you know, all those tough classes uh, that y you take. I really, my hat's off to you. Because it allows you, when you get a degree in that, by the way, I'm all for, get, get a second degree in art history or philosophy or whatever, but I am all for Education. I don't, want to, I don't want to throw any stones on that. But if you get a trade, it lets you be risk takers. If you get an engineering degree or an accounting degree or a business degree, and you want to go surf in Australia for a year, go ahead and do it. You can come back and be somebody's engineer or accountant. If you get some of the softer degrees and go surf in uh, Australia for a year, I'm afraid when you come back, you'll be saying, well, what would you like with your French fries? You know, it's not something you want to do. So I, I, I would encourage you, and all, all, almost everybody in here is in the trades. Okay, excellence. We talked about excellence before. You guys, demand excellence of yourself. Excellence in everything you do, or just don't do it. Who, is there anybody who wants to be average? If you, if, if, I hope WVU demands excellence in every area. Because it absolutely is a fascinating thing. All the areas pussy push each other and, and grow faster. It absolutely helps. But for you, if you can't be excellent at it, refuse to do it. Don't give any halfway things. Don't give any, any poor efforts on that. Now we get to the really important one. Is there anybody, and I'd like you to raise your hand if you're interested in this. Is there anybody interested in here, if I can give you the trick to getting a four point and partying every night. Is there anybody here interested in that? Wait a second, the vast majority of you people aren't honest for crying out loud. Almost no hands have gone up. <laughs> I'm raising my hand because I did this. Uh, I got very poor grades the first two years in school and then got, didn't get any more B's after that. Um, Everybody who got into this great university is smart enough to four-point this place. It's a time management problem. And if you guys, I guarantee you, I've given this trick to a bunch of people, and everybody who's taken it has done just exactly what I've said. If you will do here at WVU what you're going to do for the rest of your life, work 40 hours a week, you will get a four-point here. What you need to do is, when you get up in the morning at 8 o'clock, you be in the library or in class. And by the way, not in the front of the library where you get the study dates and everything, in the back of the library in the stacks where you're there studying. And study or go to class. Give yourself a half hour off for lunch. That's what you'll get later on. Study or go to class eight hours every day and just enjoy the rest of your life. And you'll get four points, I guarantee you that. So now you got the opportunity. There ought to be, this ought to raise the GPA of the whole school right here. <laughs>
it, it, it absolutely works. I guarantee you it's a time management problem. And let me tell you one of the big reasons it works. I would bet you 99% of the people in this room can tell me the phone number of the house they grew up in. That's because you committed that from short-term to long-term memory. We all have short-term and long-term memory. And when you reread things or rewrite them down, go over your notes within 24 hours, you will commit them to long-term memory. You won't need to study them again. You won't need to pull all-nighters, all those wonderful things I don't have to do anymore. Uh, you won't need to do any of that if you commit them to long-term memory during the year. So what you will do is you'll go to your class from, oh, mine were always at 8 in the morning, but some of you may have later classes than that. Uh, you will go to your class, you will come out, you will rewrite your notes right then, and learn them right then. You will not have to go back and cram that last day before the final and go over all your notes. You'll have them in your mind forever on that. So if you'll commit things to long-term memories, I guarantee you, you all get four points. Now then, Dean Sartorelli will throw me out of here because I'm going to take some of his business. I'm, I'm going to give you a... a a five-minute MBA for uh, all the people uh, in business school. Uh, if you'll do the following, I'll guarantee you business success. First, get experience from a large company. Large companies will give experience away to you just for a couple of years so you see how things are run. And then get a good product or service, uh, something that the, the industry or the, the, the marketplace wants. It doesn't have to be the best. It doesn't have to be the electric light bulb and that kind of thing. Then hire good people. They don't all, all have to be Steve Jobs and that kind of thing, but just good, good people. And then plan with them. Not direct them in everything, but plan with them so when they're going north, you're going north, and when they're going south, you're going south. And then give them great responsibility. Make them responsible for what they're doing. And give them great authority. And then spend about 75% of your time encouraging them, and it'll make you filthy rich. Guarantee you. Let me finish here quickly. Um, think with me just for a second. What's keeping you, everybody in this room, from doing exactly what Julie and I have done? All I had when I came to West Virginia was a good education, which you're getting from WVU and a dream. I didn't have anything else. Uh, there's no reason you can't, everybody in this room can't do as well or better than Julie and I have done. Here's my challenge to each and every one of you. Be more successful than we've been. You can do it. You absolutely, absolutely can do it. There's nothing keeping you from, from getting to where we were. I know you can do it. Don't settle for less. Absolutely be the best. And there's my email address. Let me know how you're doing. Let me know how many of you are getting four points. And let me know when your uh, career is skyrocketing. Thank you very much. I'll take any questions.